I'd like to welcome Ron Sexsmith to the Stumble Forward. Ron is a much-loved, iconic Canadian singer-songwriter with 17 albums and a novel. He has won three Junos and has been nominated for 15, as well as being shortlisted for the Polaris Prize. Ron has performed all over the world and has played such venerable spots as Massey Hall, where he'll perform again for his Sexsmith at 60 show on Feb 29, and the Olympia in Paris, as well as Royal Albert Hall in London, England. His songs have been covered by the likes of Feist, Rod Stewart, and Elvis Costello. I'm really excited to chat with him. Please welcome Ron Sexsmith. Hey, Ron. Hey, Hoxley. Well, that was one of the best introductions I think I've ever had, you know. I was like, I was going, oh, yeah, I did do that. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> so, that's amazing. That's, I'm kind of hoping to hook my, my podcast brand on uh, the best intros in all of podcasting <laughs> is, is what I'm headed for. Um, it's, like a, it's like Brian Linehan or something, you know. <laughs> Uh, that's probably an obscure reference, right? But, uh, it's obscure, but why would I mean? Why would we mean, want to reference anything that is less obscure? So, are, sure. you, are you well? Yeah, I'm well. I, I know I'm, I'm looking older and everything, but yeah, I'm pretty pretty good. You look uh, older. <laughs> you, you retain a, a boyish a boyish energy. Uh, to me, well, you don't look older at all. Oh well, thanks. No, I, I'm well. Uh, we, you know, uh, Colleen and I, we love uh, living here in Stratford. It's been really good. I think for just our whole mental state, you know, and uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, I'm good. Well, it's funny, I was going to talk about Stratford, but I'm interested, just, I'd like to wax nostalgia just to start a little bit about the early days for you in Toronto. I know you were a walking courier. I worked in the courier office of the BCE place. Yeah. It was like musicians were couriers in Toronto. And even just, I listened to some interviews of yours and you were remembering those days um, being a walking courier. And it's a vision of Toronto that I feel is kind of gone now. That version of Toronto that I dreamed to move to f as a kid from the rurals you know, uh, House of Lords on Young Street and and bike couriers and that kind of stuff. And Sam um, the Record Man, you know. <laughs> Sam the Record Man. You know, when you were a kid in St. Catharines, like, was the goal to get to Toronto to, 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 to get your star on the rise? Like, I'm trying to put paint a picture of those years uh, for you. Well, you know, I, I didn't really know it as a kid what I wanted to do. I mean, when I found out you know, that I could write songs, you know, when I was already about 20 or something or 21, I was like, it just seemed, you know, Toronto was really the only place in Canada, to, you know, to go. It seemed that's where all the big wigs or all the labels were and stuff. So, but it was hard because I had a family at the time. I had a, a kid and a partner. And so it took us a while to get to Toronto. And finally, uh, I think late eight, 1987, I finally, finally made it there. And, uh, and, you know, I wasn't, you know, the courier job was just really fateful because I didn't do that well in school. So I really wasn't cut out for a lot of jobs. And, this, and there was a job where all I did was walk all day, you know. So it was pretty. Um, and, and also, uh, I don't know how you write, but I write when I walk around. So it was actually a really good job for it was like a front for my songwriting operation that I had going on, you know. And uh, and now, I mean, uh, I had a walkie-talkie. You know, now it, all the couriers have cell phones, and I still don't have a cell phone. So, But it was really good. Uh, it was also good exercise, obviously, you know, to walk around for from 9 to 5. So, um, But, yeah, you know, but my dream when I moved to Toronto was, yeah, to try to, you know, you know I didn't know how to do it, but I needed to play the open stages and be where all the musicians were, so. I've been thinking a lot lately about dreams and about goals and visions. I feel like, um, you know, I'm wake, I'm, I'm going to be 49 shortly and I'm, you know, one of my sort of midlife wake ups is that I maybe never had a, a goal or a vision that I was working towards. I was just sort of, you know, a Canadian kid with some ability and I just bounced from one opportunity that showed itself to the next. And I've been wondering if even contained within the Canadian spirit, if, if we're so humble that we find it hard to voice or articulate our goals and wishes and dreams aloud. Does this resonate with you, this thought or idea? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in the power of dreams, you know, 
and and you know for me I re, and signs even you know I would always there were there were many times along the way where I just wasn't happening I kept getting rejected by labels and and uh, you know I, and people would get, you know say oh you know you have a family you know you should really get serious and get a job at the post office or something like this but I kept and I just had this dream from a very young age you know I was a a member of the Elton John fan club when I was nine and ten and I had this dream of making records and I didn't know how to you know I I didn't even know how to play at that point it was just this dream you know I was born on the same day as Elvis Presley and David Bowie and as stupid as that sounds that used to mean something to me whenever I would get uh you know, disillusion. I was like, well, surely it's going to happen. I'm born on the King's birthday. I'm born on Bowie's birthday. And that would keep the dream alive for me. And, uh, you know, and, and you're gathering your own evidence all the time. You know, you play a show and people really respond and you think, well, I'm not crazy. Those people really liked it, even though there's just five people or something. So you start to uh, put it together. And finally, I'm just lucky I stuck it out and that it the door started to open, but I was already like pushing 30 when that, when that happened. So. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like you and I have chatted in, in already in this conversation, you've alluded to a bit of, you know, being conscious of your age, the music business, you know, as I remember it in the, in the days when I started and when you were, you know, starting out was a, was a visual business. We had music videos and it, it helped to be, you know, handsome or good looking. And it seemed like in some ways, if you were an alien who came down to the planet and turned on much music, you would have to assume that only good looking people know how to sing <laughs> in the world. Yeah. So, um, but I feel like it, it doesn't really matter with a guy like you whose quality mm-hmm. of output is remained so strong and so high all these years that it even matters what age a human being that music is coming out of. But why are you still feeling that? Like, are you still feeling in that competitive? Mm -hmm. Like to me, this is, this is something I also wanted to talk to you about is, is the competitiveness within the Canadian industry. But are you feeling that, Oh heck I'm aging. And what does the, like, it just doesn't, that doesn't add up to me. My, Mm -hmm. my, my vision of Ron Sexsmith is a guy who has a boyish agelessness to him and is connected to something so authentic and real that the well that the music is coming from, it 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 it, it cancels out the need or importance of all age. Is, is am I making any sense? Oh yeah, um, I, you know I think initially when when I finally got signed, um, you know like I was thirty one when my first album came out, but I I looked like I was like twenty four or something. I mean I looked really young at the time, and and I. Uh, and that actually, you know, I st- and it's all sh- shallow and everything, but, you know, the that seemed to m- matter to the label, you know, like, and I mean, I remember they put a sticker on my first album that said I was 27, which was just so, <laughs> it was like, what is, what's the big difference between 27 and 31? It was just ri- ridiculous because it seemed to matter to the label. I don't know why it didn't, you know, for me, um, when I started writing songs, because uh, I grew up, my my favorite music was English music, like the Kinks and all that stuff. But when I started writing, uh, I started to get into all my, uh, you know, the, the, my Canadian heroes, like Lightfoot and Leonard. And, and those were the guys that kind of showed me what kind of songwriter um, I could be, possibly, if I worked at it. Because I loved hard rock music, but I wasn't very convincing when I played it, you know. Yeah. And and all of a sudden, so my, I always felt that my sound uh, was somewhere between the Canadian folk and the British, the you know, the, the more melodic British acts. And um, and so I didn't I, I, I didn't jump around a lot on stage. I, I just wanted to have that kind of career, you know, where you could write songs and. Uh, and you know, if you, you you may recall too, I mean, uh, the '80s was not about that, so I couldn't get arrested in the '80s. So it was kind of like when the '90s came along, suddenly it was possible to be a guy with a guitar singing unironically about something, you know. But I was, uh, I'm trying to get to all your points in the question, but I was actually quite competitive in the beginning, because um, you know, you know, I, there there was so many. I mean, you you know, you had the you know, Ryan Adams, all these people, and R- Rufus Wainwright, and and yourself, and so I was always had an eye on what everyone else was doing. Or David Gray, I remember he had this really big album, and I didn't know how to make a record like that that had sort of a le- electronic elements. And so I would, I was always trying to figure out what can I do to update my sound so that 
radio it might play it um you know i'm not competitive at all anymore like that's yeah. completely gone and i just realized that was just really you know i mean obviously when back then you you know you want to hit one out of the park so that the label doesn't think you're a loser or something but yeah. it, it was never my motivation when i was writing songs or anything it was more like when i was making an album which one sounds like maybe it could be a single and you know you maybe give that one a little extra focus or something um i've been thinking a lot about this transition into later life and let's just talk a little bit about this dream and this vision idea that we were sort of we were on to about five minutes ago are you did you achieve this dream like when you look at your life at the moment are you where you would hope to be want to be has that dream had to change at all um are you where you would dream to be back in those days when you were filling out the form to be in the elton john fan club you know you you, you always kind of have to re, uh, readjust your, your dream you know to fit or, or, or your reality you know and um I th I think you know I mean, obviously as a, a young kid I, I had dreams of uh, playing a, you know rich stadium and all that stuff you know and all or playing or having that kind of career um, but obviously by the time I I got in the door and was making records it was I it was just a very I was very relieved for one thing that it was happening but I I realized that the kind of music I was making was not what the radio was playing so i um and that was okay you know so i just had to I, I i decided i just set my sights on trying to be an album artist you know and and trying i really wanted to have a body of work and i wanted to uh be productive you know and prolific and everything and that and so you know when i look back on my career now i think well I did a lot of my dreams to really did come true. You know, I mean, I played Massey Hall. I'm playing it again. Uh, I never thought I'd ever play Royal Albert Hall. So that was just crazy. You know, mm -hmm. I met I met a lot of you know, my heroes and uh, and those weren't even part of my dreams either. So um, I, I guess the, the ultimate dream was really just to be able to uh, make a, a living doing something that I loved and also something that I felt that I was sort of good at because I'm really not. Uh, and I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not that good at most things. I'm not very handy. or So I was just so inspired when I found out I could write songs because I was like, okay, now I have, my life has a purpose all of a sudden. And, and it's, I've never strayed from that. I'm kind of like, I'm, you know, it's all, I'm sort of a, it's, it's I'm on, on the spectrum a little bit. So it's just this, I Uber focused on this one little thing. And I could remember lyrics like crazy. I could get up, right now and play a whole set of Dylan songs every verse and not forget a lyric or Leonard or any of those guys. So it's just this thing that is my superpower, I guess. And yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, my dream is not exactly how I envisioned it when I was a little, when I was a kid or starting out, but uh, it has all the parts though, you know, that, that are sort of, that has the main ingredients, I think. So. I feel like when I was listening to, to you chat in a couple of interviews this morning, and, and then just a few things you've said here already. I get this sense that there's still a, a, a real searching uh, for you at the, at the center of what you do. Uh, whatever interview I was listening to this morning, you had mentioned that I think it was like record number eight. I think it was um, maybe Retriever, where if you said that you found like you'd really found your voice for the first time, that you'd, you'd found the voice that you'd been looking for. Now that's eight records in. Um, yeah. I find that to be an exciting thing to consider because I'm very interested in the long narrative arc of a career. Um, but even hearing that you've sort of been looking to find that s soft space that would be exactly yours vocally from a production standpoint. It, um, I mean, the art in a lot of ways is in that process. Are you still in that process? Is that process what what kind of keeps the pages turning for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, you like to think that everyone's a work in progress, you know, and yeah. um, there's certain things that I could do before that I don't think I, I can do now. Like a, uh, writing a, a song like Secret Heart, uh, it was so simple when I wrote it, you know, and, and now that I find uh, that would be harder for me to do now. But I think I can sing better now, and I, I think I can, uh, I'm more like 
I'm good at problem solving. If there's a, you know, I used to get stuck on a second verse for like a whole year or something, you know, now I can, you know, get, you know, get it done. But, but yeah, I mean, I think in the beginning, uh, I mean, I had a voice, I sounded like me, but um, when I heard it coming through the speakers, there were things that annoyed me about it. Mm. Oh, it's, it vibrates too much or I'm, I'm too flat or whatever. And so every album I would, make it a point try to sing better or you know or, or i wanted at one point to try to produce a rounder tone because i i thought my voice was too nasally or something and then i think i went too far you know where i sound like kermit the frog on one or two records or something so i mean it's just and finally retriever comes along and that was an album that i, I was very uh, mentally exhausted when i made that album and i actually told the producer because i had a bunch like 30 songs i said you tell me which one's to do i don't know i just can't even think and that one just had this uh you know we had the w kind of that wind in your sails feeling where everything we were doing i just i was really surprised at how well it, you know it seemed to me and i and i think ever since then i i've been kind of my voice has sort of settled into this thing where i'm pretty happy with it but but you know i mean i'm still every time i make a record i'm always very excited about whatever batch of songs I have. And I'm always trying to figure still like this, my most recent album, the Vivian line, I think is the best uh, produced record I've, I've ever made. You know, I just think this Brad Jones did such a marvelous job of capturing what I do, you know, and, and uh, getting a good vocal and getting a, a really warm sound where it hasn't always, you know, I found with my records, like I'm proud of all of the songs, but I'm not always proud of the, the singing or the, sometimes the production is wrong. Um, and you don't know while you're doing it, you're just doing the best you can. It's always, it's only in hindsight where you realize, Oh, I would love to go back and fix that or something. So. Just quickly to go back to the fact that you say you, you, you might not be able to write another secret heart. I mean, I feel like I have some of those songs from my early career. When you said that the, the, my stomach, the cells in my stomach that are my artist cells know exactly what you're talking about, but my brain can't help but trip on that. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm with you in a way, but can you explain why it is you think that you can't access whoever wrote Secret Heart, why that, why, what it is to be older and what it is to look at a song like that and go, maybe I couldn't do that again? Yeah. Um, I think there was just, well, the thing is, um, on my latest album, I, I, you know, I have a song called When Our Love Was New. It is a very straightforward love song. So I can still do that, but I'm coming from a different place, you know, and I, I'm, I'm bringing something, whatever it is, uh, experience or whatever to it. I mean, when I wrote Secret Heart, I was, you know, I mean, I, you, you used to go to Fat Alberts, right? At one point, the open stage. Uh, it's a little before my time, but I've definitely heard of it. Oh, I thought you went there. I thought, but, um, but you know, I would hear these amazing songwriters and I was, you know, and they would have these songs that had eight verses like Bob Dylan oh, yeah. or something. And yeah. I wasn't good at that. I would try to do that. I just sucked at it. And then I remember when I was working as a courier, I go, well, what can I do? I can't do that. And, and, and my an original hero was Buddy Holly. Like he's the guy that made me want to play music. And I thought, well, what did you know he was so simple right three chords really beautiful songs and so when i wrote secret heart i was trying to write true love ways uh like for by buddy holly and and that was the first time i went to fat alberts and i played secret heart and and it wasn't like tumbleweeds rolling across you know it was all of people were like coming up to me and go oh that's a really really good song so that was the start of my figuring out what my songwriter voice was like not my yeah. singing voice but my you know what yep. to try to be really conversational try to you know if not to get you know out of my way to say something simple and and i still i still try to do that but i just I'm a kind of a different person now. You know, the music industry is like a roller coaster, you know, and oh yeah, and and just and you know, and I got knocked around quite a bit, and 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 I sort of landed here where I'm in a sort of a happy place now. Um, so I can do, uh, you know, I mean, obviously I can still write a love song and all that, and I can still, but it's just I'm not, uh, you know, I was in a different relationship back then and everything, so. Um, so I'm just bringing more stuff to the table or have more, you know, baggage and everything, you know, so. Some of, I mean, some of the songs when I look into my early career and, and 
the songs that I look back that I wrote in the middle of that stumble, that stumble in trying to find the artist that you would become. I know that what you're talking about. Some of those songs in the naivete, hmm. you write these astounding pieces of music. Um, yeah. I've got a couple of those that I feel to this day a little intimidated by because I feel like I'm in somehow in competition with trying to figure out how I'm ever going to best some of those. It, does this yeah. does this idea resonate with you? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, you're always sort of judging yourself on your past, right? On, yeah. um, you know, and there's a lot of artists, though, that really big, famous artists who, who no matter what they do, people will always talk about this record that's so old that, you know what I mean? Like Brian Wilson, they just always talk about pet sounds and, and, and that's this, you know, the elephant in the, in the room. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, do you feel like, did your voice change uh, uh, over the years too? Or did like, I find sometimes like uh, trying to get back in the, even just the vocal space of an old song can be a little tricky sometimes because, uh, uh, you know, like so I'll lower the key or something like that. I don't know if you have if those problems as well. but Yeah, I mean, there are things that I definitely recorded too high. There's, um, yeah. I mean, you've put out 17 records. I've put out in and around that same sort of number. I feel that a lot of my work attempts to rebel against the last thing I did. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I look at ACDC as a band that seems to have been very satisfied with the sound they created early on and that they could go into the studio and then more or less just sort of reinvigorate that old sound. And I often wonder, I mean, I think about what an extraordinary sort of artistic self-satisfaction there must be to love what it is you're doing enough to do it over and over again mm -hmm. i mean i guess the artist i always dreamed of being was somebody who would be willing to throw out what i did yesterday in favor of what i was going to do tomorrow because i really believe in the process and i believe mm -hmm. in yeah i believe in the process i feel like you believe in the process this walking thing i knew you were a walker i didn't realize that it had started with mm -hmm. the courier business but but I feel like in that way that you have almost you've demanded to keep a cell phone out of your life, a driver's license out of your life. This idea that you are strictly focused on songs. I've watched you at a party. I, you, you may remember Kevin Hearn, Bruce Coburn, and I being oh, at yeah. your, <laughs> yeah. your place at, uh, <clears throat> next to the park there on Queen Street. Uh, yes, Trinity Bellwoods. Yeah, Trinity Bellwoods. And I remember you and Bruce sort of being the remaining two songwriters who seem to be able to pass the guitar back and forth and sing everything. And you both knew all the words. And even that night, I remember leaving somewhat feeling like, man, are those guys, they're the real deal songwriter because <clears throat> look at how many songs they both bloody contain. Like that, the fact that you guys just had as blueprints living in you so much work of other great songwriters it really left an impression on me i i, don't, I know i really haven't asked a question i've sort of more circuitously yeah. been bouncing around but is there something there that you would comment on well you know uh i started out uh when right fresh out of high school playing the bars um i didn't be you know like i said before i didn't do well in school when i got out i was like what do i do now and my older brother was playing the bars so he got me in and i had to learn so many songs like hundreds of songs and i was like a performing monkey in a way you know and uh but i really feel it was a you know well because people would come up every week say could you learn this song and next week you know i could learn it and come play it next week i was really eager to please and i really felt that was such a good education for me because i wasn't even writing songs yet and so when it came time to write songs, I, I, all of a sudden I had this wealth of knowledge, like, oh, I guess I can go from a G to an E flat because, you know, Paul Simon did or whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. And it had this sort of access and, and, um, you know, so, so that was, uh, I, I don't know what, if Bruce did that, if Bruce played covers or anything, but I just, that's, was my big, be big be beginning. And, um, you know, it, it's just, I feel like, you know, there's some artists who are like chameleons, like Bowie and every album he's coming, you know, and there's or Peter Gabriel and is and then and that's awesome. And then there's other people that are more like I'm sure like Bruce Coburn, the production, if you go through his career, the, the, the production changes, but it, it, essentially he never strayed from the thing yep. that he did. And I feel that's more like the kind of artist I am or Johnny Cash was like that, you know, because I can't do what David Bowie did. And I wish I could, I mean, or Prince, or you know those people that are just very 
um, they're songwriters, but they're visual and they're also, they, they, they're like in the studio, they create sounds and things. I've always had to rely on whichever producer I was working with and, and all that. And I never, you know, and I'm amazed. I've made so many albums. I, I've never really learned anything about what all the knobs do and all that kind of stuff, you know? So, so I just think there's different kinds of, um, like, you know, people talk about Bob Dylan being a chameleon, but he never really strayed from the roots of the music that he always like folk and blues and all that stuff. And, and now he's almost like a full blown blues singer. Now he's just like, Le- you know, Leon Redbone or something like, um, so, I mean, so yeah, but I, I feel, um, songwriting was always the main thing for me. Like the song, the, the structure of it, does it have a, a definite melody? Have I said what I was hoping to say? And, and it's never really changed from that for me, you know. Is it a craft? Is it an art? Is it both? I would say it's both because, you know, the, I mean, pretty much every song I've written, you know, there's a, you get a sort of nugget, right, of this idea, uh, a phrase in your mind, something, or a melody. I get a lot of melodies in my head when I walk around. And sometimes the melody comes with a, a, a line, like a lyric or something. But then that's then that, that leaves you, right? And all you have is this thing. And then that's when the craft comes in because you figure, well, okay, now it's my job. That for whatever reason, this idea came to me, whether that's inspiration or whatever you want to call it. And then, then it's up to me to give it the attention that it deserves and to not get... Uh, you know, half-assed about it, like really yeah. fo- follow it through. Comp- and and that's sort of what I figure my, my job is. So it's it's the, the mysterious part of wherever these ideas come from. And 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 sometimes, you know, you'll hear you know, people will say, oh, the song wrote itself. And there's definitely that experience too, where you, where you just almost, you're on a roll. It's just like it's coming, you're writing it, scribbling it down. And, um, and other times it's really like, uh, pulling teeth, you know, you're trying to, you know, what is, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? So, so it's art and craft, and sometimes it's more craft than art, and vice versa. So, um, and and I try not to be a snob too, guys, because sometimes you, you know, not every song can be, you know, bridge over troubled water, right? It's like sometimes you have to, to write, you know, you can call me Al or whatever, like this, right? I mean, it's there's these ditties, and then there's, and you, you know, what when, when you're in the middle of it, you're like, oh, I think this song this song is going to be substantial and this one is more frivolous or whatever, but they, they require the same amount of love and care and attention. Um, and cause you want, you know, I don't want to be the master of one emotion. I don't want to make a record that has the full range of emotions. And, and all my heroes did that, you know, uh, they had a sense like Leonard Cohen had a great sense of humor, you know, and it wasn't just gloom and doom and stuff. So anyway, uh, so the, all these things come, come into to play, when, when you're making a record or when I make a record. So. Are you writing every day? No, um, but, but, but I am, I tend to be in the middle of a bunch of songs at, at any given time, but sometimes um, I'm not working on them. Like I have like about 10 new songs that are s- different stages of being sort of finished. Yep. And, um, and, and you, you know, you see an album taking shape and you start imagining it, but then you think, oh, I don't have everything I need yet. I need a couple more, or this one maybe isn't so strong or something. But, um, and, and oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm sitting around the house playing other people's songs more, you know, more often than not. You know, I got really obsessed with Warren Zevon during the pandemic, and I find I, I'm on this thing to try to learn every one of his songs, so I'll just be playing his songs. But... Um, but then there are times when I'm just super in the zo- kind of in the zone where I am writing or or uh, not just writing or finessing song like you know what I mean going back tweaking songs and and because it's like you you just see and realize there's something they're kind of there but they're not quite there yet and and then and it's like the light bulb comes on over your head you realize what needs to be done like oh I know I gotta I gotta take these lines that I of a stray verse and make a bridge out of that because I'm, you know, I haven't been able to come up with any more lines or I don't know. It's just all this stuff. It's like a puzzle, you know? And, uh, are you keeping like, if you're, if you're 
in in a rotation of 10 songs and knowing that you have sort of like a jay-z capability to keep all this music in your head are no. you like recording this stuff on a cassette so that you can refer to it later or are you when you revisit a song that you're in the middle of writing are you kind of going right back into your memory where it's currently alive and waiting it's mostly on my my memory um i don't have a i i mean i have garage band on my computer um and for some reason, I, like my old computer crashed a couple years ago and my new computer, the garage band doesn't sound as good to me. So I've been using it less. But before when I had a bunch of songs, I would demo on my garage band, usually just piano and voice or guitar and voice. And I'd always sort of double track my voice because it sounded, made it the demo sound a little dreamier or something. But mm -hmm. um, but I haven't really been doing that. Um, but but lately though, I mean, I, I have, uh, uh, you know, lyric folders of my new songs I'm working on. And um, so every now and then I'll get inspired and I'll, I'll just put up the lyrics and I'll just run through all the songs. And usually while I'm doing that, I'll, something will occur to me like, oh, this song's too long or, the, or needs this or that. Uh, but yeah, I don't have any, I don't have a dictaphone or anything like that. Right. So. And what's a common tweak? Like when you say you're going back and you're combing over this stuff, are you like, there could be a better word here? Are you making subtle melodic shifts? Like, because frankly, I was listening to your music over the last couple of days and it's like, I mean, it's as a, as a piece of, as a craft, as a piece of construction, they're so, so gorgeously symmetrical. Like everything is so clever. It's like, Everybody gets to build a building, but somehow your building is just that much more oh. lovely in the light, you know? Oh, so thank, thank you. So what are um, the little tweaks? Like, what are you going back to revisit? Um, it could be anything. I mean, oftentimes the lyrics have always been the hardest part for me, but I know that I can do it if I'm patient. I don't want to, you know, get lazy about it. But, but yeah, sometimes, it, I don't know. I've been trying to think of an example, but it's just more like you like you have a really good first verse and sings really great and then the second verse there's a few clunky bits you know and you and you might realize oh i can use a similar rhyming scheme in the second verse if i move yeah. this word around or something like that and you know it's funny because you put all this deep you know attention into these little details and and it, very few people even notice right like like, like I mean, it's nice when someone says like something what you just said there because it, I f you feel like you're this crazy person doing this thing that you probably would have been fine had I left it alone. I don't know, but I, I I'm I'm very um, and I learned a lot of this from Mitchell Froome who did produced my early records because he would say to me like, uh, do you really need that verse or can we get to the bridge faster? Is this key okay? And and so now, oftentimes, I find myself going, "What would Mitchell do here?" You know, and, and I, I really, I mean, I learned a lot from all the producers I worked with, um, to a point now where I can, I can, uh, you know, I don't, not that I'm ready to be a producer, or anything, but I feel like I probably, if I had to, I, I, I probably could, my own, my own stuff. So, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I oftentimes too, I'll try a song if I've written on piano, in a certain key. And then I'll try it on the guitar and then something else will come out just from playing it on like a rhythmic thing that I wasn't able to do on the piano. They'll have a ballad that all of a sudden becomes an up-tempo song. Or um, I find if it's, if you just sh shift the key a couple notches, it brings out something in the melody that wasn't there before. And uh, so it's, it's any number of things really. Um, and even sometimes after the album comes out, I'll, I'll, I'll be like, oh, man, why didn't I do this instead of that? You know, so it's this. And then, you know, you get the chance to change things when you perform them, I guess, too. So. So um, just a, a, a sort of a, a, a songwriter's taste question. Um, yeah. Do you put the meaning of the word ahead of the way the word sounds and feels to sing in a song? What's more important? Um, I think oh, that's a good question. I mean. Obviously, I want it, everything to sing well, you know, I yeah. want, um, but I also don't, because I find there's a lot of, I don't want to name names, but I hear bands sometimes out there that have these great, really melodic songs, but the lyrics it feel, um, they don't connect with me because I feel like they're just singing words that sound good and they don't, or it's like stream of consciousness. 
Some mm -hmm. people are really good at stream of consciousness, and some people, I wonder, do you even know what you're singing about? You know, um, <laughs> you know. I mean, I wonder that. I mean, and it's none of my business whether they do it, but I, <laughs> I, I, you know, but I wonder, like, um, but you know, so lyrics are important to me too, because I, I, but but it's not like everything has to be deep, right? Like I like the song, you know, "Someone's Knocking at My Door" by Paul McCartney. You know, it's not I, saying anything deep in me, but it's like that. It's just perfect for that song, right? It's just like it it has a nice groove to it yep. or like you know or you know there's some songs like you know i love uh you know start me up by the rolling stones it's, it's not something you're gonna recite by the fireplace or anything you know what i mean but it's it's a uh, i think that's the thing you you want to find a lyric that uh, the mar it's a marriage of lyric and melody and like i remember there was this band that i was they asked me to help write some songs and they were like a rock and kind of bluesy type rock band which wasn't really my forte but he was the, the singer really wanted to have he really loved the u2 and he wanted the u2 kind of lyrics and i was thinking well i don't see i don't think that would work with that kind of music you know because u2's lyrics are very you know what i mean it's a lot of uh image like metaphors yeah. and religious imagery and all this kind of stuff yeah uh, i mean maybe it would work i don't i just couldn't hear it you know when you think of that you know that kind of blues rock it sort of conjures up this whole other thing, you know, of this. Um, so I just, I just think whatever it just, it has to line up, I think. Um, but I definitely want the words to have a meaning and I want them, I want them to sing well, if possible. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a slightly roundabout way to get to uh, an off the beaten path topic around puns, which yeah. you're, a pun, you're a pun master. I'm a, uh, <laughs> you know, I, you're a pun Yoda. I feel like I'm a pun Luke Skywalker. Well, uh, you're too humble. No, I mean, I just love, uh, you know, I, I think you were doing it before I was doing it. So, you know, I, well, uh, but I, I, I bring it up because for, if, I want to just quickly touch on a couple things around puns. Yeah. I, I feel like people like you and I who are so invested in the way words sound. I mean, yeah. how much how much of my awake brain power is being used to weigh the value of words? I mean, I'm weighing the value of words constantly. I'm weighing the value of how they sound, how they feel, how they taste to sing, what yeah. they mean. I tend to opt for a lyric that feels better to sing usually instead of if it, if you can get a, a good feeling lyric that means something, heck, that's obviously the best. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then I'm always, I, I'm, I, I'm kind of, again, I'm working to the, towards this, Ron, so pardon me, you'll have to be patient. Yeah. Uh, I'm always, in, I'm blown away that people are, um, offended by puns, like oh, people's yeah. response is offense. And, and I, I've, I've done a lot of thinking about this. And, and here's my thought is that your language is connected to your belief system and your ego in many ways guards your belief system. And if some jerk like you and I, who is in the business of words, come by to tell you <laughs> that you've seen a word 2000 times in your life. And yet you and I have seen another word lurking within that. Word. <laughs> yeah. And then these people, it's their egos that are, well, why do you have to go and mess up this word that I now I have to have a dual relationship with this word? I, I'm, I'm always perplexed. And I see it in your in responses to your, I mean, lots of people love your puns. But then there's those people that their instant response is to be offended. What do you think's going on there? Well, I've had people unfollow me because of my puns or, you know, <laughs> they're like, oh, man, I can't listen to your music anymore or whatever, all this kind of like, it's like, well, it's weird, you know, I mean, for me, it's just an extension of writing. It's wordplay. Yeah, Word, exactly. It's fun. John Lennon had so much fun with words. I mean, you ever look at his book? It's just all same with Dylan, right? It's, it's for me. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I, it's not all I do into it. I do puns. I write poems. I write political things you know yeah. but but I'm, I'm really just trying to make it a fun place for people because and i know i probably tweet way too much and i get it's an insecurity thing or whatever um but you want you know if you can life is hard and if you can make someone groan or laugh or something and I, and also I was, to kind of counter this reputation i had for a long time of being melancholy or something you know or being a sad right. sack and so Twitter for me, which I, I absolutely did not want to know about in the beginning, the label talked me into it. I was like, well, what? they really did. They said, all you got to do is like get on there and tell people what you're up to. And I was just, I didn't like, what am I supposed to do with Twitter? And, you know, my, uh, my I've always loved Groucho Marx and Jack Benny and all these people. And, yeah. all, and these puns were always occur 
peer, you know, popping into my head. And before Twitter, I really had no outlet for it except to make my drive my band crazy with with these stupid puns, you know. <laughs> and uh, like, I, and and all of a sudden, there's this outlet. I remember when I first got on Twitter, I, I was like, I know, dare I, you know, I tweeted the stupid thing, and got this enormous response. And I've only, you know, I had 600 people following me in the beginning because my management was running it. And now I've got like over 60,000 or 63,000. And because I've tried to, you know, I do puns, I upload videos, I do, I, I, I do birthday, you know, if there's an artist yeah. I love, it's, you know, and, and as well if, if they pass away. And, and, and I feel like I've got this, um, and there's people like yourself that I love on Twitter and Dave Merritt and people who are yep. funny. I think Tanya Tagak is really great on Twitter and Jan Arden's really great on Twitter. So, yep. um, uh, you know, and sometimes people will come after me if I'll say something political. You know, they, I spend the day blocking people, and it drives it drives me nuts. So I, these days, I try to just I don't even want to get into that. So, so I just, and I also recycle a lot. I mean, sometimes if I can't think of a pun, I'll just use one, find one from about three years ago. And not, no, <laughs> you know, and no one cares. It's it's like I'm not a professional comedian, you know. And uh, but anyway, it's just like I, I just think, um, you know, I. I really like what you do on Twitter, and and I really like. I just, it's a, it can be a really nasty place, and I try oh, yeah. to. Make, and who knows? Maybe one day we'll have to. Elon will make everyone pay for it, and then I'm gone. I'm not going to stick around if that happens. Right. So, you know. Yeah, I left Twitter for a long while there. About a year I took off from it because it was really. I would tune into Twitter, see something that would turn my stomach upside down, and then I'd be ruined for the day, and I was, you know, turning into not a good husband, not a good human, but yeah. when Twitter's great, like you say, the Dave Merritts, Ron Sexsmith, those who are kind of still using Twitter as a fun outlet, <clears throat> it, it still is a fun outlet. Um, I, I'm glad you still call it Twitter, too, because I refuse to call it I refuse to call it X or whatever. It's, 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 so, child, it's so childish. It's like He's like a, an evil villain that would be on his lair, a big X, or, you know what I mean? It's just, it's like that. So. <laughs> so. Let's talk real quick here about being a Canadian artist. Yeah. There must have been moments along the line of you going, I should move to the U.S. or I should move to the U.K. Was there? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, I got, like I said earlier, I mean, I, I had, I got rejected really by every label in Canada about two or three times. And finally, I, 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 ha I managed to get a deal in Los Angeles, and there was uh, at the time this thought, well, maybe I should move there, you know. Yeah. Um, but I'm just, I've really, I know I've made records there, and I love being there, but I don't drive, and I'm kind of like a be a fish out of water. And uh, and I always respected Gordon Lightfoot for staying around. He didn't move yeah. down there like all those other guys did. And and also, I mean, Eng England was the birthplace of a lot of my favorite artists, and there was talk about living there for a while um, because that's actually my biggest market is the UK and um, you know Ireland and all those places and I have spent a lot of time there but you know my I'm, I'm just such a hoser really you know <laughs> like a Canadian and I just love you know I love Canada I feel safe here I don't feel safe uh, other places the world feels like especially more than ever now it feels it's really gone berserk you know mm -hmm. and I don't really want to be away from home that much. Uh, but uh, I just feel, yeah, there were times where I, where there was talk, we should go here, you know, again, when I was more competitive or whatever, trying yeah. to, I, I need to be where the action is or something. Um, I don't really think that's, uh, you don't necessary anymore, you know. I mean, that Bonnie Bear guy lives somewhere in the woods, doesn't he? <laughs> I don't know where he lives. Like, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, so I just feel, uh, now that Colleen and I have found a, a home we we couldn't af afford a house in Toronto. It, there's a feeling like uh, of security, you know, that I never had really before when I lived when I was always renting in Toronto. So, part of when I wanted to do this podcast, I wanted to talk to musicians, comedians, creative people, um, creative Canadians. Because in some ways, and by no means is this like the principal reason, but one of the sort of sub reasons for wanting to do this was feeling like now that there are basically no entertainment news sections in Canada, there's no music on television, the the media landscape for Canadian music as as it as it was when you and I started is basically gone. 
And I'm I'm having this weird feeling like there's going to be a lot of artists that don't get properly celebrated when it comes to the ends of their careers, just because it doesn't really feel like Canada has a robust enough media atmosphere to even find a way to celebrate these artists in a way that would be meaningful to an entire country. Mm. So do you feel like, do you feel recognized by Canada? Like, what do you feel like your legacy here? Yeah. You're about to do Sexsmith at 60 at, at, at Massey Hall. This is going to be a big event. Um, well, you but know, what, what do you feel like uh, in terms of Canada knowing Ron Sexsmith? Well, that's a that's a pretty kind of powerful question in a way for me because you know, as I age, I do feel I wonder if about legacy. I've mm. I've really tried to you know contribute to the Canadian songbook. My whole career has been about that, and and there was a time when it felt that was really valued. To you know, to not not myself, but just the, that whole endeavor. Yeah. You know, uh, yep. you know, you could be Lightfoot or Joni, and I was always saw the, uh, put those guys way up there, and Bruce and Neil. And I felt I, I I felt when I came along in the '90s because the '80s wasn't about that. You know, the '80s was about was rock, and it was like yep. you know, and all of a sudden I felt well, here I am. I'm carrying on in this sort of troubadour tradition. And initially, I, you know, the Sarah Harmer was out there and, and all that stuff. And I, and I felt like, yeah, we were kind of car- trying to carry on that thing. And I don't really hear that these in the, sh- you know, the Sean Mendes and those type it's, it, they're coming at it from a whole different place. It's like a more of a, you know, club thing, or I don't know what, what you'd call it. And so yeah. I don't, I don't really don't, don't know anymore if, if it means anything to, to anyone. I know in my little world of my fan base, they appreciate it. Like, for example, I'm doing this show, Sex Myth at 60, and it, and it, uh, may, may, maybe in another time that the, that would be something the industry would celebrate. But I don't feel there's any incentive for the label or anyone to really give a crap about it. So the reason I wanted to do it, um, I, I was trying to stand up for my own career. Like, hey, look, I've been doing this. I've been toiling in obscurity for all these years. And uh, I've really felt it had to be at Massey Hall in uh, – I really, I just wanted to kind of stand up for myself. And and also, you know, I mean, 60 has an X, Sexsmith has an X. I thought that was like a, you know, so I had to do something with that, right? And and so this is just my way of saying, hey, everybody, you know, look, I'm still here. I've survived the music industry. I'm, uh, I've never sold a lot of records, but, uh, you know, I've, I'm proud of what, what I've managed to do. And, and so that's kind of was the point. Cause I, I, I really wonder about that. Sometimes there used to be a feeling of that the record industry and the, the, you know, the, the songwriters hall of fame and all that kind of stuff uh, was, I don't know that I, I, I like, do you feel, I mean, I feel like that it, there isn't a lot of uh, incentive for people to care in those in those areas especially in the ind- the record industry side you know i, I mean I, I mean mostly like care about someone like me who's older and this and that you know they're all excited about all the new things for sure so. yeah i i definitely feel that the canadian industry um lacks a certain self-confidence <laughs> and um and a willingness to kind of have an open arms feeling about all of that. Um, I mean, it's a complicated country. I feel like Canada's going through a self-loathing as well right now where yeah. it's like, um, <clears throat> and and I feel like how many times have I heard even, oh, that, you know, they're not, this this festival isn't looking for you, which is yes. the, the white singer-songwriter guy. <clears throat> so I know that we, you know, just in terms of where we fall and in, in, in the disposition of the country socially at the moment, it's, you know, where there's there that the public or the industry is looking for something else other than what you and I might look like. But, and, but, you know, I, I have some understanding of that, but also I love individual brilliance and somebody mm-hmm. like you who personifies individual brilliance, like I can't help um, but see the songwriting game as a meritocratic universe where I want to celebrate <laughs> yeah. the person who is phenomenal. To me, it's it's when you post on your Twitter that you're listening to the Warren Zevon, uh, you know, 
album or you've got Tumbleweed Connection on or whatever it is. You're, to me, yeah. that's evidence to me of a guy who is <clears throat> at the top of his game as a songwriter, yet still... <clears throat> And I'm not even sure, maybe it is just nostalgic for you, Ron, but I feel like you're going back to the well to see how like the original batch of Master Carpenters did things. And I feel like in some ways your sense of lineage within a long multi-decades songwriter's narrative, you're, that's where your head is at. And I sort yeah. of think that's not necessarily where the Canadian music industry's head is at. No. There's just not enough money. There's not enough entrepreneurial spirit. There's not enough like want for invention. And I, I sometimes feel, and maybe even going back to the, the, the question around Canadian competitiveness, there's this sense sometimes I feel like Canadian artists are all fighting for the what's left of the scraps. Yeah. You know, we have a small country. Nobody became a millionaire here in Canada. Um, the industry runs itself on grants and 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 not much in the way of entrepreneurial success and i feel like canada just hasn't really been able to find a place of extreme self-confidence where we could say yeah world go fuck yourself we have ron sexman it's just not it's just not where i don't feel that's it's kind of who we are culturally i wish we did have a sense that we should be celebrating somebody like you mm. and maybe it's even Maybe it's out of ego. Like I hope when I'm 60 that I'm that I'm yeah. sort of recognized. I mean, even these thoughts around legacy. Uh, I don't know. It it's it's ego in a way, but it's also part of how I understand music. You know, like I understand music because of legacy. Well, yeah, and I mean, I you know, I I, I try not. I mean. You know, animals don't worry about if you know anyone's <laughs> going to re remember. It's this weird human thing, you know. <clears throat> And, and then you try, like, oh, it doesn't mean anything or whatever. But you're right, you know, the, the culture has shifted to a place where, you know, I mean, there was a time where I was going to the journals a lot and getting nominated. Yep. <clears throat> but it's a different landscape now, and the culture has shifted, and we're kind of a bit, in a way, persona non grata, in a, you know, and, and there's a feeling of, oh, yeah, like a dinosaur feeling or something, you know, or you guys had your time. And I'm okay with that, actually. You know, I'm fine with that. <clears throat> but... um yeah, you know, it, it is, I do feel like, uh, you know, I mean, the, I, I don't feel the camaraderie, you know, sometimes within the community that I see in other countries and, and stuff sometimes, you know, or or between the, the, the women songwriters, there's a lot of camaraderie, you know, I think, and lifting each other up. I don't always feel that in Canada on the guy side. Mm -hmm. um, but I realize, you know, when I listen to these old records, I'm just letting people into my world because I'm I, I'm a bit set in my ways. And I love these records. I just I love the whole ritual of putting on an album and hearing the needle fall and 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 that's again that's part of my my Twitter world, you know and um, you know so and I and I realize you know I'm like I I mostly listen to older things. You know that's just kind of where where my head's at. Um, but those are the people that um, changed my life and you know, made me want to do this. Um, so, yeah, um, that's such a big question, all that, because, you know, I just try to be grateful that I got in the door when I did. I wouldn't know how to do it now if I was starting out. Yeah. That I have a fan base. Uh, it took me like four albums before anybody noticed me here. It wasn't until Blue Boy where I started to notice that more people were coming to the shows. And, and I think initially people thought I was from England because everything they heard about me was from coming from over there. And you had quite a, a thing over there too in the beginning, right? I remember you came to my house one day, remember? In, yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. R Riverdale or yeah. and, uh, where I was living. <clears throat> so, and like Feist too had to go to France to make it, you know what I mean? Like, like this is, is a feeling. And, there's, and meanwhile, you got bands like Blue Rodeo who are really big here, but not really big anywhere else. So mm -hmm. you can, so, so I used to get, I, you know, you can complain. There's always some reason to complain, but I'm, sure. I do. I do feel lucky that I have an international career. Like it's like a cult following, but I can go most places in the world, and people, you know, who, there's people that are into me. I would hate to go to England and play for a room full of Canadians. You know what I mean? So I'd, yeah. I'd like. I like. Um, so I'm. I, I'm really grateful to. Uh, what I have really, you know, and, and, but I still complain about things, right. You know, because that's what humans do, you know, we gripe and, and that, but yeah, this whole thing about legacy is so funny because it really doesn't matter, but 
but but it is something everybody when you get older you you you, you like to think that, that you've done something that matters to somebody or and even though when you're dead you're not going to know anyway if anyone's still listening to you and stuff it's just <laughs> yeah. it's something sad that's why i mean like i say animals aren't concerned if there's Oh, is there going to be a statue of me when I'm gone or some stupid thing? It's all ego and vanity. And uh, hopefully we'll, you know, you, you, there's a great humbling that comes, I think, eventually when you just realize, well, you know, this is what I made with my time on earth. You know, this is what I did. It's yours now, you know, or something. Yeah. So, yeah. I feel like the <clears throat> the popular music business is underpinned by ego and what, what was the other word you said ego and uh and, and vanity and, or... and, yeah, and vanity like i sort of feel like again <clears throat> in my way i'm a student to i'm a student to pop music in 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 probably a way that's similar to you yes but also in my own way and i think that if you're a student to pop music then yeah like vanity and ego were elemental to the beatles and the rolling stones oh you know? for like, sure and and even within the context of like living out my dream, my dream is crystallized in the dreams that have gone before me. In yes. and so the the in some ways the way I recognize my dream is that it should resemble dreams from the past. And what is elemental to some of those dreams of the past is the legacy effect of that music. Yeah, which is why I think I I hope in my little way, even though, like you say, from an animal perspective, once I'm dead, it doesn't matter. But I'd like to think I'm making something that would have the effect on me that the music that had the effect on me, yeah. you know? Oh, no, I'd totally. like to be a part, of that, a part of that ecosystem. Yeah, you know, I mean, it is It is like, you know, you were working really hard and, and we're working on this music and it's and it means whatever it means to people, you know? And, and yeah, you'd like to think, uh, I mean, not that the music industry owes us anything. It really doesn't. Yep. You know, there's so yep. many artists that didn't have any, like Nick Drake or whatever, hidden, had no, no success until after they were dead and a lot of poets and things like that. So, but yeah, there is this feeling like, well, why don't you celebrate while they're still alive? You know, we're, and, and hopefully, uh, and, you know, and, and it's something you can't, uh, like I said, this whole show that I'm doing was just me saying, I, I just want to do this for myself, you know? And, and, uh, you know, and that, that's why I'm doing it. And so, because you never know if, if anyone's going to, at the end of the day, going to care about what you've done or anything. So, um, but it, it, you know, I think that it's the work that matters, you know, you put the, put it all in, the, in the music and then at the end of the day, hopefully people will appreciate it and, for, and it will resonate in, in some way, in some meaningful way. And uh, that's, you know, that's all you can do, really. So, What you had said earlier about uh, Lightfoot not going to L.A. like like the rest, and I, I know you're probably referring to Joni and Leonard and Neil, all those yeah. all those great Canadians that went out to sort and of Burton. find their, yeah. for, find their, yeah. right, find their fortunes in, in Los Angeles. I mean, I have a love of Bruce Coburn, and I feel like it's a similar... It's similar in the sense that you and I chose the two Canadian nerds who decided to like <laughs> stay in Canada and yeah. not kind of become yeah. iconic brands, if 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 you know what I mean. I, I even I've interviewed Bruce a couple times and I interviewed him once for the Globe and Mail and have more or less tried to get it out of him. Like is there not resentment, but is there a subtle envy that, you know, some of your cohort went off and became famous while you sort of stuck to your guns yeah. to be a great songwriter. Like it's weird, those decisions that get made, but I feel like even in, in the heroes I've chosen, I've chosen them very specifically. And I feel like you chose Lightfoot very specifically in the same way that I've chosen Bruce very specifically that they, there's something of an underdog, you know, not like they are, they're internationally recognized, but they certain none, those two names are not Joni Leonard and Neil, who on, we only need to hear their first names to know exactly who we're talking about. Well, those guys, I get it. I get why they went to California. You know, I mean, that's Toronto. The music scene wasn't really happening the way it is now or what, you know what I mean? And yep. also, also to escape the winter, which was pretty punishing. Um, and that's, it just seemed like, 
not, you know, people, everyone was going to California, you know, people from all over America were going to California and England and stuff. So <laughs> I, I, I get the appeal of that. And maybe if I was at the, around at that time, maybe I would have gone too. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you know, I mean, I, there's something uh, to be said, you know, for, for staying home and, and, you know, because there's a beautiful thing, uh, you know, keeping it pure, keeping it something that's, that's really, you can't get it anywhere else, you know, like people, yeah. there's a lot of people, uh, I mean, you can still hear Canada when Joni sings and when, when Neil, but, but for the longest time, you never almost didn't think of them as Canadian because you always thought of them as part of that California scene. Um, where Lightfoot is, is like as Canadian as Tommy Douglas or any, anything like that. And that's a, and that's something that's really precious, you know, I, I, th I think, uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, uh, you just, like I say, Feist had to go to France to kind of make a name for herself, you know. Yeah. I mean, I tried in Canada. I would have been happy if I had a sort of blue rodeo type career where yeah. nobody knew me. That would have been fine with me. It just it it just didn't work out that way. <clears throat> and and that's the thing with everybody's career. You you start off maybe you have this big dream as a kid, but but you don't get to decide. You know, it's sort of a yeah. it, you you're you're following it more than leading it and. And so, uh, and then at the end of the day, you're like, oh, okay. You look back. It's like, I, I, I can't remember the exact quote. It's like, when you're living and life just seems this chaotic thing, you know, like nothing makes sense. And, but when you look back on it, it's like a finely crafted novel. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. And, and I think that really makes sense for most people's lives because when you're in it, you know, you just don't know. You just, you think you're doing a good job or you're doing the best you can and, and then, you, you know, even your mistakes and all that, you don't even realize until later, like, oh, my God, why did I do that or this? And so it's a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff you don't notice until later on. So. I won't bug you for too much longer, Ron. We'll wrap it up with just a, a sort of a look at what it is you're planning for the Sex Myth at 60 show at yeah. Massey. Um, well, does Massey intimidate you? Yeah, I mean, it really does. I mean, uh, but that was the one venue, you know, when I was still a courier, I used to have to walk by Massey Hall almost every day on my route. And, um, and you know, there's, uh, for some reason, Massey Hall seemed doable. Like, you yeah. know, I never thought I was going to be headlining at Maple Leaf Gardens or anything, but I always thought Massey Hall's not that big, you know, and I felt, and that was the one venue, like in the 90s when I got signed, so many times people asked me, if if I would open for them at Massey Hall, and I would always politely turn them down, because I I really wanted to wait until I could headline it. And finally, yeah. in 2006, I did for the first time. And Lightfoot actually uh, came to my show, which was one of the biggest honors I've ever had. But yeah, Massey Hall. But it still scares me. This will be the fifth time I've played it, and it's a hard venue to play because it's so it's big and it's expensive and. And yep. it was really, it was really, really difficult getting this gig, you know, booking it. So, I mean, it could be, you know, maybe I'll never even never play there again. I don't know, but I really felt for this show, it just has something that I love the Danforth Music Hall and these other places, but Massey has has this sort of extra weight to it. Because yep. I mean, there were times when I couldn't afford a ticket, and I would listen to the whole show by the stage door. You know, like the Kinks and you know yeah. Steve Earle or whatever, and I'd wait for them to come out and I'd get their autograph and all that. That that's a big part of my whole thing. And and so Messy Hall to walk out on that stage is there's really nothing else like it. And yeah. so I'm really so I'm doing this show with my band. It's the first time, you know, I've, we've played since 2018, and uh, so that's exciting to me. And and people are coming in from all over the place, people, you know, from England, from California and Virginia and from the East Coast. So so I really hope to fill it if possible and and not to make too many mistakes. And, uh, uh, you know, so I'm super excited about it. You know, yeah, I should tell you real quick, you know, when you I saw you in Peterborough and you 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 do have this sort of you pre apologize a little bit like you just did. <laughs> I mean, your st your show was fantastic in Peterborough, and even just when it's just you on stage, I know you had apologized that you didn't bring the band, and like, maybe yeah. it's because I'm an old man, but <clears throat> I was so glad to see you, just you being you, um, yeah. in that purity, being able to hear every lyric, um, which isn't to say that 
seeing you with the band isn't going to be amazing. I feel like the last time I saw you with the band was in Vancouver at the at the Culch, which was oh, a, wow. lot of years, yeah. a lot of years, a lot of years ago. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't surprise me that people are flying in from all over the place for whatever reason. Like, I feel like I have some connection to being able to take the temperature of the zeitgeist. And I just feel like there's heat around this show for you. And it, it would, I think it will be a success. I mean, I, I, yeah. And I know it's selling well. And I mean, I hope it's, yeah, I really, um, well, don't, don't, I know. Don't, don't, go go ahead, Ron. No, I was saying, I mean, you know, there, there are like some moments I'll be playing by myself during the show and there might be a guest or two, you know, and things like that. So it's going to be a very different show than, and I'm fine to play solo too. Cause I, I've really, the last few years, it's all I've done. And there's, yeah. and there's some people that prefer me that, that way, you know, just by myself. And, but it's just, you know, it is a th certain kind of thing when you're with your troops on stage, and, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? It's a little less nerve wracking and, um, so yeah, but anyway, I, we, we're, we're, you know, we're going to rehearse two days before the show and hopefully we'll be able to put it, get it together, you know, really, really fast. So it'll be great, Ron. I really am grateful that you agreed to have this chat. Um, Jenny and I are going to really attempt to get to the show on the 29th. Oh, amazing. Uh, all the best to you on for that night. And really, um, it's been lovely this last couple of days, kind of going deep on your career and preparing to chat with you. Um, you know, from the inside of the music community, I know you and I have spoke in the past about how what you, you've already detailed that there is some disjointedness in the sense that it's not it's it's not a collective behind the scenes. Um, and I feel that in many ways, it's a lot of, to do with the fact that most of us have been busy getting on airplanes to go and yeah. tour over Hell's Half Acre half the time. But some of that ego and competition, you know, when given some years to chill out. Mm -hmm. um, I can be a middle-aged person looking at, you know, uh, a, a national icon, a national hero like you, oh, who is being, who's, who's getting the well-deserved recognition and this opportunity at 60 to sort of remind us all by showing his wares, like just what an important voice you've been. Thank you. And I can say that in the fullness of, of um, you know, that with my, you know, pride and humility intact, it's, mm -hmm. it's important. Uh, it's, it's not a, it's, I think I'm attempting to never think from that scarcity place anymore that, that we are in, you know, we're cradled in an abundance. And, um, mm. I feel like, I mean, even let's just real quick run. I know I said, I'd let you go, but you did mention in a couple interviews that you talked to God and let's, yes. let's just, uh, this is interesting to me because I feel like I had quietly had a bit of a Christian narrative in my early music. Tell me about what it is for you talking to God. Well, it's not even a Christian narrative for me. I mean, yeah. I did I did go to Sunday school. I was the only one in my family who went to church. I'd go by myself, you know, you know, bus would pick <laughs> me up because uh, I was just interested. You know, I was interested yeah. in the stories and the, I liked the singing. Me um, too. But I always had this idea as a kid because you when you're a kid, you wonder about things. And God was a was pretty big. Like I wonder, and I for some reason I I came up with this idea that God was in the sun, and that or how else would He be able to keep an eye on everything? It was in you know He was must be in the sun. So I would just talk to the sun uh, on my way to school, or if I was playing soccer or whatever I was doing, and and it became this thing. Even when when I was a courier, I would do it. I'd be like, Oh, there you are. How are you doing today? Or whatever. Like nothing, nothing important just almost like small talk you know or um i remember one time i when i was a kid i got thrown out into the hall for uh, talking in class you know and the sun was coming in the window in front of me and i'm like can you believe this i was just borrowing an eraser you know whatever and and um and the teacher heard me talking in the hall and came out and grabbed me and brought me back in the class and made me stand in the corner you know and but but that was, uh, and I felt for a long time I didn't talk, didn't do that. And I really feel looking back that it was sort of a dark period for me where I wasn't connected. I didn't feel connected like I did, I once did. And it's not, again, it's not a religious thing. I'm not, I'm not thinking that it's a guy with a beard in the sky or a woman with, or a woman with a beard in the sky. I don't know. You know <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I just feel there is something mystical about life you know and something about 
songwriting and you see it in in paintings and you hear it in music and sometimes you're watching a movie and one of the characters says something and you're like oh wait a minute you know was that for me you know that i and there's a lot of things like that that go on and i and, but i think i feel in the last few years i've sort of gotten reconnected with it uh i i don't I, i'm not a religious person uh but i i do i, I do feel like i am a god conscious person mm. and whatever that means it's just a feeling that um it's not that there's someone getting involved in your destiny or anything like that but it's just i don't know it, it's just it's a child a childhood thing really that i've i've just always it's like maybe meditation or something yeah like you, <clears throat> I, I also went to Sunday school and thought that church was amazing because of the music and because of the stories. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I'm always interested in, you know, there's lots of musicians who will proudly claim that they're atheist and whatever. Mm -hmm. I, what To me, it's like, if you're on stage and you've had an experience with music where you can see its power, in the way it changes the temperature in a room, that it it it, it alters the the atoms in in people's bodies. Like <clears throat> when you are witness to music performing its magic, I've always found that if if you don't believe that there is a spiritual aspect to this life, and you know a thing or two about how music can change a room, then to me that's somewhat incongruent. To me, like when you have acquainted with wow, music has a power that is ethereal mm. then it's almost like well then your next the next plausible step is a is like you say a belief in god consciousness yeah. which to me is is natural and it didn't surprise me to hear that in in fact i was quite delighted um and yeah it's nice to hear you speak of that with mm through that lens like you say it's not religion it is a consciousness which i believe is probably a very true way to assess that thing whatever that is yeah or the the source or whatever people call it. you know what i mean there's people believe all kinds of things really you know but i i mean this is kind of stuff i could talk to you all day about this kind of stuff you know but but this has been i mean i think this is one of the best interviews i've ever done so i really i was really happy that you asked me to be on your show um you know because there's a few people over the last year who've asked me to be on the show and then I never hear from them again, you know? So I was like, Oh, well, what was that all about? No, but this was really nice. And, uh, uh, yeah, you guys should come to Stratford sometime and hang out. You know? Well, Ron, <clears throat> bless you, fella. Thanks yeah. very much for this chat. Thanks for the kind, uh, yeah. words about the show. I appreciate it. Thank you for doing it. I mean, um, we'll be thinking of you, uh, all Thank the best you. for the 29th break a leg. Um, and maybe if you, are interested mm -hmm. maybe later this year or sometime next year we can get on and chat again and we can just start very from the, st the starting line and and have a sort of a god mm -hmm. and spiritual you know yeah. a discussion about how that stuff plays into our lives and what we do okay ron yeah man thank and you I, so I, very much man and i still like to do that songwriter tour with you sometime and i still yeah. want to do that too yeah, so like we'll do, we'll do that Okay, yeah. we'll, we'll do that. Okay, we're, we're doing just keep, it. Just keep doing what you're doing, and then we'll end up in the Songwriters Hall of Fame together. You know, just Sounds good. <laughs> All right. No, okay, take care, buddy. Thanks, man. Thanks, Oxley. Okay, bye. Cheers. Bye. 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 The Stumble Forward is an Isadora Media production and is hosted by Hoxley Workman and produced by Jennifer Kavanaugh. Be sure to subscribe and follow The Stumble Forward. You can support the podcast at patreon.com slash Hoxley Workman. Thank you for listening. Stumble Forward. Stumble forward, the stumble forward.